tell me about just how you joined the military. What, when was that and what were the circumstances? I started off when I was in uh, high school and there was, I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated and then there was a summer youth employment program that offered you 50 days at $30 a day in 1984. So I decided to do that as my summer job. And then we had the opportunity to transfer to the reserves afterwards. And I thought I would do it for a couple of years. So I joined the Calgary Highlanders. But back then, women weren't allowed in combat roles, so there was only five any gender positions in the unit. So I had to actually join the Calgary Highlanders band. So I w had to play the drums in the band until a clerk position opened up, and then I transferred in as a clerk in 85 to the actual unit. And then, and then I stayed, and I kept going on courses, and I did some Class Bs, and I went to... Um, at the time, Mobile Command Headquarters in saint Bear, Montreal, or Quebec, and worked Class B, came back, worked some Class B as a clerk in the orderly room, and then I transferred to Regina. And I, in that time, I became a Master Corporal. And then when I went to Regina, I took some courses and became a Sergeant with the Regina Rifles. And then I was very young, because at, at the time, you could go quite quickly, so by 23 I was a sergeant and by 26 I was a warrant officer and then I commissioned in 94 um, to lieutenant logistics officer and then transferred up to the North Saskatchewan regiment I had a thing for infantry units apparently but I never joined the infantry obviously <laughs> and then ended up being laid off my civilian job in Saskatoon and coming back to Calgary for a class B at the brigade headquarters and then the pension came in and I'm here now about to deploy again to Kosovo. Too much? <laughs> no, that's good because it also lets me check your microphone. I mean, I'm going to check. That's the information I'll put in the text as okay. well. So, um, what was it like? What, was, what were your first impressions of the military when you joined in the 80s? For somebody who wasn't there at the time, how would you describe it? Um, it, was, it was more like an old boys club and they didn't really know how to deal with women at all. And I was really naive. I was 17 and I remember being yelled at by my warrant officer, you know, why are you staring at me? Do you love me? And other things which I was just in shock at. And the, um, it was all guys. It, in the unit, you became one of the guys, but outside, you were just a girl. So that was, that was different. And you had to sort of try to be a guy if you wanted to have respect. So you had to be tougher, and you had to talk ruder, and you had to be meaner, and, and you had to just do everything. So... Yeah, it was different. And then in oh, 1988, I took my JLC course in Petawawa, and it was um, a national trial, so it was the Reg Force um, course with all reservists from across Canada, and we did it in Petawawa, and the RCR Battle School ran the course. And that was um, interesting. It was back in the day when he tried to break you, and a course was successful, a leadership course was successful if you ended with, you know, a third of the students or less. So we started with 36 and graduated 12, and there was five women that started and two that finished. And that was, that was um, somewhat hard because you had to fight a lot of guys that never had ever worked with women before. Um, I remember my first day there, the sergeant was trying to be politically correct and said, you know, I realize there's women here and we don't know what to do with you, but on occasion the F word will slip out. Well, I'd been with an infantry unit already for five years, so it really wasn't a shock to me, but they just didn't have any idea how to deal with you at all. So then when I came back, um, I was approached by recruiting to do recruit school bypass and go directly to the infantry school because I topped my JLC in Petawawa, which also didn't go over well because the RSM tried to make me number two because he said a woman, not in his day, will a woman ever pass a leadership course. But my course officer was a woman, so that's the only reason I came in first. Well, 
I earned it, but that's why I got it. And then when I came back, it was when the crew trials were going on, the combat-related employment for women, when they were bringing women in and trying to integrate. But I'd already experienced the, <coughs> we don't want women in and women can't do it as much because you're, you know, you're weaker and we're lowering the standards in order to let women in. And so I didn't want to be that poster child, so I decided to stay where I was. Jerry, I'm assuming you must have thought about quitting it. Did it ever cross your mind at the time? To quit? Yeah, just to say screw I it. I thought quitting about about quitting every two two years, three years. I thought I'm, if I hit five years, that would be amazing. And then I thought if I hit ten years, that would be good. When I hit ten, I thought, oh, two more, and I have a CD. And then, and then you had your ups and downs, like every every job, where some days you love it, and the other days you're just you hate it. You don't want to be there. You don't like the people. You don't like what you're doing. Your head's being butted against the wall, and then you do something good, and it makes you like it again. And you have new people in that are that are good and respectful. And was there a time that you can think of when it got better, when there was a change, or was it just really incremental over the time that you've been in the service? <clears throat> well, it hasn't always been bad. Um, there's been bad incidents. Um, when did it get better? Probably the more senior I got in rank, the better it became. But then a lot of that has to do with being senior and being in charge and not having as much many people yelling at you or telling what to do or anything like that so you're now the person in charge and um, when I commissioned as a lieutenant I I guess I had a, a belief that everything would be so much more civilized being an officer and I gotta say as a lieutenant it wasn't as I became a captain then all my peers I, I, I was treated just like a peer. So uh, there was never really, every now and then I'd have, and I call him an old dog boss that would treat me like a girl and, and treat my peers, you know, speak to them and sort of exclude me and that type of thing. But I have a fairly strong personality, so it didn't really affect me that much. Yeah, so why did you stick it out? Overall, I like it. I like what we do. I believe in the Canadian Forces. Um, when I went to Afghanistan in 2011, I was in a really multinational environment. So there was mainly Americans, but there was all sorts of, of different countries represented from Romanians, Belgians, Italians, Austrians, Brits, um, every, everywhere, people from Greece, from really all the countries. And it made me appreciate our leadership, and it made me appreciate our training, and it made me appreciate our professionalism. Because um, sometimes you question it. When you have one bad apple that does something that's a little bit iffy and they're a senior rank to you, you think, really, this is the organization? And then you see the way we are and the way we're respected overseas, and it, it made me think, wow, there's a huge difference. And it made you proud to be part of the Canadian Forces. Yeah. Can we talk a bit about that? About your, what did you, uh, when did you go overseas, and what did you, uh, what did you do? <coughs> I went from March to November two thousand and eleven, and I went to the Information Dominance Center in ISAF Joint Command Headquarters um, in Kabul. So, I went in through Kandahar and picked up all my gear and went to um, up to Kabul. And I, my job was supposed to be a governance analyst in the Information Dominance Center, so working for the CJ2, which was completely out of my, <laughs> my experience level. Um, but when I got there, the job wasn't very challenging. It was basically filling out a spreadsheet and um, looking up documents and seeing how the changes were in the leadership in the country, which was sort of more along the lines of what a corporal would do, but the person before me wasn't didn't have a lot of capacity. So that was the job that I had handed over to me. And I went to my Brit Lieutenant Colonel and said, you know, there's got to be 
got to be more. So it gave me a lot more, and I started publishing some papers on leadership changes and on a variety of other things. And then our team of governance in the IDC, there was a governance team, an ANA, ANP team, and a development team. And <coughs> the development team Le lieutenant colonel was leaving. It was an American. He'd been going uh, there for a year. So when he left, my Brit colonel came and asked me if I would take over the team. Um, because there wasn't a replacement coming in. So I was moved over probably a month later to be the development team lead. And that was neat because we were working for stability operations. So I got to go to a bunch of meetings with USAID and, you know, at the embassy and work with various non-profit and NGOs and where we were really more the military liaison when they would be telling us of their development opportunities and we would make sure that there wasn't anything on the military side. It was, it was a good, it was an interesting job. And with that, I got to leave the camp quite a bit. Um, flew into Black Hawk to Bagram. That was good. That was interesting. It was fun. Um, <laughs> on a key leader engagement, I dealt with a lot of generals and higher ranks. So it was interesting seeing it from the strategic side and dealing with the different campaign planning and all of the OPTs that we attended and just getting to dig in and seeing all the capacity and working with Americans was interesting. It was, um, I thought that we were really similar until I worked with them and then I realized we're not as similar. So that was interesting. Um, and then, yeah, I, I had a good experience. In the for the most part, you know, it made me really appreciate Canada and my family and everything that we have and things like that. We, um, I volunteered for a women's bazaar. So there were these two American Afghan women who had had American citizenship, but they came back to Afghanistan to try and do a um, like an entrepreneurial organization to try and get women to sell their wares and actually earn a profit where they weren't in the past giving their goods to the men who would take it to the bazaar and sell it and they might get you know five cents on the dollar of anything that they sold if that if they were lucky and so this women's organization was set up where there would be two guys that sold carpets and they had a big truck so they would go to the various villages and pick up all the women's stuff and in the morning they would drive into the camp and the women would come in their taxis and we'd have to go outside into the streets and meet them in the taxis and escort them through the security and, and that was interesting because the men would always want to go through the scanners. Um, the women didn't have to do the um, biometrics but the men did and they would want to go first and so we would have to stop them which was kind of fun because they don't have any a lot of respect for women over there, a few altercations but it was good. Um, <laughs> have one silly experience. I, I don't know. <coughs> the truck when it came in, there was a gate that had a scanner. So it was supposed to go through that gate, but it didn't. So it came in this gate and a military person had to escort it to the other gate. But what he, what it, so I hopped in the truck with them to escort him to the other gate through the camp to the gate. <laughs> but he turned around and went into the streets. So then I found myself driving it <laughs> in a, in an Afghan truck with two Afghans and a bunch of carpets through the streets of Kabul with no one knowing where I was. That was a bit hairy, but it was fine. Actually, afterwards I thought it was probably the safest I ever was on the road, so. And I had been doing this for about six months prior to that, so <laughs> I'm sure the time has passed, I can say that story. And then <laughs> 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 that was not a good one, but it was fun. Um, and then what? Well, I, I remember bringing the women through the um, the gates one time, and I was, I'd sort of learned my lesson from being on the streets the first time in just my, just my uniform with my pistol and soft hat. It probably wasn't smart either. But now I was fully geared up, and I had my helmet, and I had all my PPE, and I had my C7 and pistol, and I, I had my hands crossed, and I, I was wearing my engagement ring, and one of the ladies, um, pointed over and was motioning like a charades type thing to my ring and then showing me her ring and um, 
she took it off and passed it to me, so I thought, well, I guess I'll pass mine. <laughs> Hopefully we're not exchanging. But I gave her my ring, and it went passed around. And then a couple of the younger girls, um, around 14, 15, 16, they could speak a bit of English. So from there, it was quite funny. Even though I was all geared up, the conversation went to, oh, you know, are you married? Yes, do you have uh, any children? I have a daughter. My daughter's 14. Oh, I'm 16. What grade is your daughter in? Nine. Oh, my daughter's in grade seven. And, and just the common, the common family talk and the, you know, oh, I, they wanted their daughter to go to school and the one was hoping to be a teacher and another one was thinking about architecture and just the progress from the years before where there was nothing and and then the one girl saying oh you know my my father and brothers are dead and so we have to support the family and then I you know you think man my kids at home <laughs> going to Cirque du Soleil and and concerts and learning to drive a car and never has doesn't have a care in the world about you know and doesn't really appreciate the fact that she just is entitled to an education and so that was touching <laughs> That was one of my, that was one of my happy moments. Sorry, I'm a teary. <laughs> Do you want a tissue or something? No, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious about. I'm just gonna stop. A second. You mentioned uh, just to go back. Well, let's go back to the, the the beginning of the Afghanistan. So now you're you're towards the end of your career because you're gonna you know, but you wanted to go to Afghanistan in 2011. Why? Um. I wanted to go because I had been the person at home dealing with all of the um, the casualties. Can we stop for a sec? Because <laughs> uh, good. Okay. Yeah. So we just again look at me. And so, why did you want to go to Afghanistan in 2011? Um, I wanted to go for the experience, and I wanted to go because I had been dealing with. Um, as the G1 of the brigade, I'd been dealing with all the casualties and the notifications and the just the um, really just the experience and to see what what it was like firsthand, to see what we could be doing, to see what's really happening. And I had never had a tour. I just didn't have really the opportunity from in the early years not very many women went on a lot of tours and there weren't a lot open to reserves and then and then as life went on I had a job and then I had a child and then I was a single parent so I didn't really have a lot of opportunity and then this came up and it was a perfect time for us and our family and and I wanted the experience and there was a few jobs I could have picked from a lot of them were like watchkeeper duty officer and this one sounded interesting even though it was longer <coughs> um, so uh, how difficult was that being the G1 with with those notifications because you're dealing with all the issues that relate to them it was the um, the constant bell ringers and so we had a bell ringer all the time where that's the notification that someone's either been seriously injured or killed. And it always happened in the middle of the night. And my job would be to go to the headquarters and start, you know, advising the chain of command and getting a notification team to come in and make sure it was everyone was briefed and understanding the family dynamics and you know, if it was an injury, we dealt with it differently. If it was a death, it was immediate. And sometimes things didn't go right. Um, and s then we had to assign an assisting officer, which they call a designated assistant now. Um, and that's the person that assists the family with understanding all of, you know, the military aspects, the repatriation of the fallen, the um, all of the the military aspect, the what has to happen. <clears throat> um, and quite often I would take the designated assistant to the family the first time. So meeting all the families, I mean, there was, it's the worst moment in their life. And it, 
it's it's hard to watch. It was there's such dignity and some family members there was such grief. It was hard because you felt really bad, and some of them you never even, well never met, um, and you didn't know their families. And then there was it just yeah it just felt you just felt sad. You just thought ugh, and then but you couldn't be. <laughs> you had to be not. You had to be the compassionate but not break down person which which got to you after a while and I noticed that I must have talked about it at home too much because my daughter phoned my husband one day and called him a bell ringer <laughs> because there is a fish that had <laughs> yeah and it's not that funny but it was kind of funny because she phoned him to say there was a VSA um, vital signs absent in a fish <laughs> and she thought it was <laughs> Like, and she was using all the military terminology. She was like 11. So <laughs> thought I really have to stop bringing my work home because it was, it was bad. And I realized that I was in my way of dealing with all of the casualties. And there seemed to be a lot because we didn't just deal with our 41 Brigade. It was anyone whose family members were in Calgary area or the 41 Brigade area. So it was, um, it was, it was, it was tough. And I think I'm quite resilient, but it was, it was tough. And I wanted, oddly, I still wanted to go over, even though I saw what happened when somebody was killed or seriously injured, I still wanted to go over. And with the full understanding that I could be putting my family in that same situation, but at the same time, I just thought, I'm in the military. This is what we do. This is, like, I am not going to be around for, you know, five, ten more years, so I don't know if I'll ever have the opportunity to go on another tour and and I wanted to be part of it. You said it didn't always uh, go right or, or like it was supposed to some of these notifications. I don't necessarily want to go into specifics, but in general, how do you think the military handled that aspect of the Afghan war? Sadly, we got really good at it. Um, the first few times we didn't know what to do we didn't know where to send people and and afterwards we had a lot of training so you never know what to say to somebody when you're telling them their son or daughter has been killed overseas so we had notification training and we had professional comes professionals come in and and teach all the senior leadership and run through scenarios and we went through exercises and dry drills and when it came to the actual event then we would be ready and know what we were doing and it would happen quickly the things that would be out of our control would be you know the primary notifi next of kin hiking and being out of the area for 13 hours and the person that was killed wasn't the only person so then you have to notify someone so that it can be released to the public because you're in a lockdown until the next to kin have been notified. Um, you can't control when someone overseas is grief stricken because a person in their battle group was killed and they phone home and that person goes to console the next to kin and the family, the military hasn't been there yet because we're waiting for a padre to come. You can't, you, you can't control when someone's gone to work and they work for a major media place and you have to go in with in you know three people in uniform and tell somebody that their husband has been killed and you, you now, now you're in <laughs> you're in a news studio that's that that wasn't it was handled very well and it was everything was very respectful and it was respectful of the wishes of the family and it was um it was dignified so everyone, I think, that was repatriated, it was dignified. Um, I thought we got very good at it. Yeah. Is there anything more that you want to say about that aspect of, of your story? Um, I don't want to do it ever again. I, <laughs> I, I mean, you... Um, no, it was just heartbreaking. It was just heartbreaking to see the, the young kids. I remember one young fellow never met, not part of the brigade, 
didn't know anything, and we were given a, a name of a next of kin that wasn't the same last name. It wasn't, it wasn't anything. There was no, we had no background. We didn't know what the story was. And when it came out, this person had been raised in a very unstable home life who had come through a lot of adversity and joined the military and, you know, in the early 20s was killed overseas. And the unstable home life is pretty, the, the next of kin wasn't a relative, it was someone that had taken this kid in as a youngster. And so it was, it was heartbreaking to think that you've overcome so many negative obstacles and, and now you're dead. And then you can't stop, you can't help but go for what? And I remember being in Afghanistan and I was in a, um, I was in a meeting with the Minister of Education. And we were talking about the coalition forces being there and how come we haven't solved their problem. You know, why haven't we solved their problem? We've been there nine years at the time. We were there nine years, you know, this guy was saying, my mother said that, you know, anyone can solve a problem in nine years, how come they can't? The Americans come in and all those other countries, they haven't solved the problem. And we asked, what are you doing about it? Like where, what have you as an Afghan person, what have you as the country done? And at that time, I remember thinking, if you're not going to want to fix the problem yourself as a country, why are people dying there? And then I would think, man, I just met these young women who are getting an education again and who are, you know, have a hope for a future and who you know, the families are there. It was just so mixed. It was up and down and up and down. And I was hospitalized for um, uh, something that turned into a kidney infection. It was really bad. It, so I was in this, I was in the hospital in the role three. And because I was a woman, the other three wards were men. Um, there was Afghan, an Afghan ward, a coalition ward. And then there was the women and children ward. So I got put in that and it was very different. Even though it was the French hospital, there was no privacy, you were just sort of in a bed, but the women and children had to be supervised by a family member. I remember being really drugged up thinking, is there an old Afghan man praying <laughs> across the room for me? Yeah, there was. It was during the time when they used to, I can't remember the period, but they prayed at least eight times a day. And so every time I would come out of my drug-induced stupor, there'd be this old bearded Afghan man praying across the ho the um, hospital room. And then I finally came around. But even in that situation, all these little kids and the things that we would take for granted. One girl was about to lose her legs because she had a sore that wasn't treated properly and it got into the bones and she was, her legs were all wrapped up. They were trying to save him, but it didn't look very good. Another lady had tried to kill herself by lighting herself on fire, and she was in the bed next to me and with third degree burns, and that was really horrible. And, <laughs> and then there was little kids that, you know, the first day they'd sort of come over, and who is this pale white person that looks really bad and is throwing up all the time? And then on day three, they were coming over. I had my little laptop, and I'd put on a Disney movie when the kids would come by, and they, um, they would start to watch. And next thing you know, they'd sit on my bed, and then they'd start cuddling in. And then by about day six or seven in the hospital, the moms would have a routine where they would just pick up their kids after dinner, plunk them on my bed. That was my cue to turn on the computer. And, and then they would go and have tea. <laughs> so it was kind of funny and they didn't know I was in the military because when I got out I came back to visit them and bring them some presents they were really cute and uh, I came in in uniform and they were just shocked they had no idea and another time about a month later at the women's bazaar the one little girl she had um, there was a combine accident she had fallen into the family combine and the the top of her head had sort of been cut open um, so she was recovering though, and when she came back into camp for a follow-up visit at the hospital, she saw me there with the, with the women, and this little kid just ran over and jumped in my arms and gave me a big hug, it was really cute. Her dad was looking at me, he had never met me, so <laughs> I don't think he was quite as excited about her jumping in this soldier's arms, but it was really cute. That type of thing is the stories I take away. You know, I, 
I remember driving one night back from ISAF headquarters back to our camp, and I was with in a two-vehicle move. I didn't move like the regular Canadians. I went with the Brits on their MoveCon or in a DIA vehicle because I had a guy from the DIA that worked for me and my team. Um, so we were in a two-vehicle move, and a vehicle cut in between us, which wasn't good. So the driver got around, and we were now two vehicles again. But they didn't like that. So they cut us off again, and the one door opened, and they pointed their weapon at us, and we avoided. And I remember those things, too. Like, I remember the threat of, of knowing constantly that some people just wanted to kill you, not for any reason other than to get you away. And then you remember the human stories of, you know, the, the mom of the burn victim who was going to sleep on the floor. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, he, there's an empty bed. So I made her a bed and made her get in there. And then she would come and pat me and whisper something to me all the time. But she would, like, pat me and stroke my cheek. And it was, it, it was just that, you know, if you're kind to someone, they're going to be kind back. And then, and then the other part of the country, which wasn't, I digressed quite a bit there. <laughs> you also mentioned earlier, uh, you thought Canadians and Americans were kind of like brothers and sisters before you started working with them. How would you describe the differences or the similarities between our two militaries that way, or the people in our militaries? Um, they're 20 years behind us, a as a general rule. I met some really wonderful people. I worked with some really wonderful Americans, um, the chief warrant officer analysts, the, you know, my full colonel in charge of the IDC. He was great, the one. Um, but then there was some of my colleagues, like the majors and lieutenant colonels that were, they didn't have the same training. When I was there, they were doing. They were repealing the "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," and so we all had to watch PowerPoint presentations. There was, you know, what are, what are, you, why do you know this type of information? You're just a, you know, a logistics female officer, which I found odd. There was a lot of female officers that were very competent. We just seemed to have a broader viewpoint. I remember talking about um, with a, a Brit about. I can't remember, going to a motorcycle show and saying, oh yeah, I was there and there was a bunch of women, um, my Adj and her wife, and the thought that we had, the, the, homo, the homophobia, I guess, w I had one colonel say, don't ever talk to me about that again, that's horrible. And I thought, wow, you would not be in my military because how can you be so close-minded? Um, going into OPTs where you're discussing a plan and you're, you're looking at the campaign plan. And we were at the stage in mind where we were going to be handing off from the coalition led to including the Afghans and getting them to start taking the lead on the planning. We were in that transition. Um, and this is the way it works in, Ameri in America. So it works this way between the US and Mexico. We have dogs, we have this, we have that. It's going to work that way between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Like, no, it's not. Do they like dogs? No. Like, it, it was the American way is the way. And if you don't believe us, well, we're going to force it down your throat. And I would find that you'd be talking to the Afghans, and they would, you know, say, this is what we're doing. And you could draw out of them, you know, why are you doing it that way? Have you thought of doing it? So I found that Canadians were more likely to listen, guide, and mentor. And the Americans were, you're going to do it our way or not at all. And I had a few discussions and arguments with some people about that. And even saying, you know, what do the, what do the Afghans think when you're saying this and they're saying no? What, what's there? Well, I don't care. This is the way it's going to work. And I found it very close. So I found that we, were, we had a broader knowledge as well as our specialty. We had consistent leadership. And by that, I mean, you could find a lieutenant colonel over there who didn't really have any staff training. And when you started talking in OPTs or campaign plans, they had no idea what you were talking about. And then you'd find a captain who had a lot of knowledge. But you'd find, a, if there was 
a case of, there was a case of sexual harassment when I was there, and the woman got sent away to another camp. Actually, three of the women got sent away to different camps. One worked with me because, how dare you say that about the general? And I thought, wow, we'd have people sent home for that type of thing, and it was pretty blatant, and it was observed, and it was, it wasn't just an allegation, it was a fact. But uh, it was just dealt with differently. Are you saying that all three women had made allegations against the same American general? Yes. General. And he stayed. And they all got shipped somewhere else. And I didn't quite get the connection between the motorcycle show and homophobia. What well, because I said my adj and her wife. Oh, okay. All right. Which I never even gave any consideration to because uh, who cares? I mean, that's one thing I've seen change in the military, too, in the 90s when we were, um, when same-sex marriages were acceptable and benefits brought in and everything else. There was the transition, much like when women were brought in, brought in, <laughs> when women were allowed in combat roles, there was that transition of this is really bad and all women are bad and everything's going to go... Uh, same when we had the same-sex marriages come in. Oh, I don't want to go in the field with someone, which is really ridiculous looking back on. Um, so we've grown leaps and bounds. We still have a way to go, but compared to the Americans, I, like I said, I, I don't want to paint them all, but I found that the mentality was very, USA is the only way. <laughs> USA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Donald Trump will be saying that soon. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you brought it up. You, how successful do you think the integration of women has been in the Canadian Forces in your, uh, well, in your service? You know, I, I honestly think that it depends on the group. So it depends on the, like, I... Eh, I see the service battalion working together, hand it, you know, male, female, you would never know they're just what they are. I see the signalers working together and you never know what they are. Um, I don't see a lot of women in the combat arms. And I hear stories about some of the women in the combat arms because it's like the dating pool is bigger, which brings it down to the, our latest Operation Honor. It's one thing to identify the problem, but what do you do about it? And it's going to be, it's going to be a change. It's going to have to be from the leadership down, saying, "You're you're a major, you're a lieutenant colonel, you're a corporal, you're a corporal. Let's eliminate, let's eliminate gender and and you know the joking that we do. I mean, we do a lot of joking. I just filled out that." a survey on sexual misconduct and it was uh it brought back a lot of negative memories which i again you know you, you have five percent bad and ninety percent good and five percent you don't really know how to classify but that five percent if it's bad it's pretty it's one bad thing can ruin an entire reputation of someone or an organization you know it depends on what it is it it's and it depends on how it's treated but I remember talking with a few of my female colleagues and saying what would you do if someone came to you and said this and like how do you deal with it it really comes down to dealing with the change we're still in a change situation I'm at a senior rank where I'm I have very few instances of any really even awareness of what happens on the floor at the armories anymore and how the integration is. Um, at my rank level, do I still experience some issues? Mm -hmm. Sadly, I do. Even from the female male, some, not very many, like hardly any, compared to when I was a young corporal where, I mean, I, I was just a target. <laughs> but when you're in and <laughs> when you're one of very many, you know, if you're one woman and a hundred men, someone's going to look at you and, and think that you're a dating opportunity. Whereas now, 
it's not necessarily that. It's more on the you can't be a senior because you're a female. This is a man's army. But a lot of that is going away. You know, the the peop the young captains that I have work for me that are, you know, in their 30s, they're, I've never had an issue with anyone working for me. Never. Not in years. I just have a, a couple more questions. Um, just that same line of thought. So you were in the room uh, in August when Colonel Conrad, I, think, I don't know if he asked the question or it was brought up, you know, would you, are we at the point where you would want your daughter to join the Canadian Armed Forces? You have a daughter. How would you feel about that? I wouldn't want her to join a combat arms unit. I would be okay with her joining the Navy. I'd be okay with her joining the SIGs. Maybe the service battalion. I would not want her to join a combat arms unit still. Um, just because there's still a culture that I see that hasn't changed as much as it should have. Where there's still the elitist mentality. If you're not a Highlander, you're not anything. I don't have to listen to you. And if you're, you know, if it's that sort of mentality. And if you, and if you are, well, we're going to, I don't know. I still, I still see it and I still hear little stories from some of the troops that will tell stories. But no, I wouldn't want my daughter in a combat arms unit because I don't think we're that far, far ahead yet. Can we um, go back to Afghanistan? Because you, you, you said you have kind of mixed feelings about maybe the, the broader, what are we doing here? Is it, is it worth our soldiers' lives? But also to the, you know, you had some very good experiences as well when you connected with people. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the medal on your chest, when you think ab about your service there, how do you, I guess, how do you assess it? How do you, how do you feel about it in the in sort of in the broad sense? In the broadest of sense? Like are you, I guess, are you, how proud are you with it to see that medal with your medal? Oh, very proud, very proud to know that I went over, that I contributed, that I was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice for the country and to broaden the world globally. Because I think that some of the, I mean, today the world we live in, we have threats that can start in a country like Afghanistan, but be global as we've seen. So being there and trying to change the country and trying to even a little conversation with the Minister of Education or uh, that type of thing saying, what are you doing about it? And getting in the campaign plan and getting the Afghan people to actually participate in changing their, their country and not allowing you know, the Taliban or any of the other uh, insurgent groups that would come in to take over their country and, and have enough strength that you know, that could be changed. So, yeah, I'm very proud that I went. I'm very proud that I went. I'm cautiously optimistic that it will have made change. Um, I, I would hate to see anybody lose their life in another country for any reason. So that, but it's part of what we do. So I, I mean, I could have been killed too um, for a good reason. No, but it's because what we're going into isn't about me. It's about the bigger picture or about the individual who was killed, which is horrible. It's about what were they doing? What was the big picture? Not just the mission they were on or what they were doing or what village they happened to be in. It's the whole country change. That's my personal opinion. And, and more than, I mean, you're, you're a, a senior officer, you, you dealt with the notifications that we already discussed, so you certainly knew what the risks were going into it. So what kind of, how did you, how did you justify it or explain it to your husband and your daughter at the time? 
What were those discussions? Um, I think they just knew. They just, it, it, it's hard to say that I want to go and put myself in harm's way. It's hard to say I'm willing to put myself in harm's way and potentially break up our family. Um, but I think they just knew. I've been in the military at the time for 26 years when I went, 27, I don't know. And I had never deployed up until then. I had always been the back, the support staff. Very important job, actually. I think those people should get medals too. But I had never actually been over there and I wanted to see what it was like. And I think they understood from all the years of the notifications and dealing with the casualties and dealing with the training and sending people out the door, you kind of get a, like you're missing out on something. I, I want to be part of this. And I think they knew I want to be part of this. It's, it's, I want to have that experience. I want to go there, even if it means I'm, that's when I'm gone. It wasn't fun. The first, until I came home on my break, I, I know it was really hard on my husband. He was, um, I, I kind of did all the family stuff. I, you know, I, we both worked, we both did our thing, but I sort of was the one that took our daughter to appointments and set this up. And I mean, he coached, he did all the, all the stuff, but I was sort of the one that was the, if she's sick, I went and got her from school. I, and then I was gone and, and he had to step up to the plate a lot. And it was a huge change for him. And I remember we would fight overseas about it. And we would have nasty conversations on the phone about you're gone and all you have to worry about is, you know, getting up and going to work and I've got to do this and this and this. And I'm thinking, wow, it's, it's not quite like I'm not really, I'm not telling you all these stories because I don't want you to worry. I'm not telling you about the eight Americans that were killed 300 meters away in my camp and we were on lockdown for hours because the Romanians sort of messed up the story. It was actually one Afghan that had killed everybody. But we thought there was insurgents running around the camp and uh, it was... So then when I came back and I told him all those stories that was were going on and by then his life had adjusted and he he didn't feel as resentful. And my daughter was in grade eight going into grade nine and she was in her own little social world and I I don't think she even noticed that I was gone actually as long as my husband was taking her places and doing things. I mean, they went to Cuba, went to Toronto visiting people, went, they, you know, he took her to everything that was, so for her and the friends were over and she it was just like, oh yeah, mom's gone, but she sends money. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> It was, it was really hard, but it strengthened our relationship um, in the end because it made us, I don't know, for some, some bizarre reason, the eight months apart made us stronger than we had been ever before. So I'm about to deploy again in, in a week and I'll be gone for another six months and we're actually looking forward to it. It's not, I think my daughter is um, an adult now, so she can, you know, fend for herself and I'm not going to Afghanistan, I'm going to a much calmer region. So, <sighs> yeah, it was, it was tough. They understood. My mom didn't understand. No, she was quite, like, quite angry. So you deal with a bit of guilt there. When I left, my family was good with it. When I was there, it sort of hit that, oh my God, you're really gone and you might not come back. And then at the end, it was, it was good. It was, it made us, yeah, a stronger family. Where are you going to now? What are you going to do? I'm going to Kosovo. I'm going as the deputy commander of the Joint Logistics Operations Center. I don't know exactly what my job will entail, but it's really overseeing a lot of the logistics aspects of, I believe there's a bunch of camps in Kosovo and into Greece. Um, and Macedonia, so hopefully I'll get to do a bit of traveling. And the threat really is more of a global threat than anything. It's still the, the political aspect of Kosovo and their location.
And then when you come back, you're going to retire. You gotta, so any sort of final thoughts on your, your time with the military from the early 80s to, to now? As you, or is it too soon to look back? No, it's not because I'm already I'm, I'm on leave and I've pretty much left and it's, it's been um, it's almost as if I'm retiring now except with a little six month trip, <laughs> and it's it's changed me. I I mean I went into the military as a silly little seventeen year old high school kid who really didn't have an ounce of discipline and didn't know what I wanted to do and didn't really have a plan and certainly I remember my dad saying well this should last a week because you <laughs> you know you don't follow direction at all and you won't like being yelled at and and then it's been 32 years now so and I've seen change like I said I joined when women weren't I mean, there was five any gender positions. They didn't have to be women in the Highlanders. And now there's, you know, female senior officer in the Highlanders. There's, I don't know if there's any female, there's no female senior NCOs, but they could if they wanted to. I, that's another question. From being treated like you're just date bait to, <laughs> to going up through the ranks and commissioning and being in charge of things I never thought I'd be in charge of and being in positions I never thought I'd hold and being viewed by others in a much more senior fashion and dealing with different countries on, uh, you know, the higher level. It's been an amazing time when I look back on it. I prefer to look at all the good, the bad, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I think I'm pretty strong. So I think it's been an excellent experience. Yeah, when I reflect, I don't have any regrets. It's, it's made me quite a strong person. Is there anything I haven't asked you, sort of your final chances that you want to say, clarify, or No. <laughs> no, I can't think of anything. That was really good. Thanks very much. It was. <laughs>